welcome to week 11. It's probably a pretty busy week in your life right now, uh, what with pretty much everything being due, either now or very soon. So we're going to take a brief detour into looking at one of the emergent areas of new marketing. And by new marketing, I mean something that's about 20 years old compared to something that's about, say, 70 years old, which in the history of chemistry is still new. But basically what we're looking at from a timeline perspective is the emergence of the smartphone providing us with a new distribution channel and new outlet to engage in marketing activity. So mobile marketing, I will say I, when we first talked about in marketing back in 96 to 98, I was very skeptical about the concept of M-based marketing because it was being driven by SMS, which was no real significant upgrade from direct mail. It was being driven around the idea of being able to call people when they weren't in their houses, and that was basically T-marketing, telephone marketing, or you know, telesales, telecalls. There was a whole bunch of stuff that pre-existed. With the advent of the personal pocket computer that masquerades as a phone, there are a lot more opportunities that we've come to recognize over probably the last 15 years. But quick history. This is what the first mobile phones looked like. They required a car battery to keep them charged and running. Uh, 1981 was when the mobile phone emerged and went from the phone went from a device that was stuck to the wall to a device that needed a small car to, because it was that heavy. You wore it over the shoulder like it was some form of army radio communications device, because largely it was. By 2007, we had suddenly had an outbreak of better technology uh, with a lot of the R&D that gave us the iPod and then gave us the iPods upgrade into the iPhone, which gave us the iPad. 2007, smartphones really start to come into their own in the mass market sense. And Apple's willingness to create a full-scale digital infrastructure so that they had the ecosystem, that's where they beat the market. That's where they beat the other elements, is that there were better, and there still are better technical solutions, they're just not as bound by an ecosystem that turned out to be mildly to moderately better on key relative advantage requirements. At the beginning, one of the key relative advantage requirements that the iPhone beat the rest on was that the supporting software, iTunes, was actually quite a good marketplace. It was easy to manage your phone, you could buy applications, you could buy music, you could buy videos, you could buy things on the desktop and that went out to the phone, and you could manage your phone much more easily. Ironically, as we have evolved versions of iTunes, it's become progressively more useless, and that's because a strategic decision was made to withdraw from the desktop software market and having a desktop software marketplace and focus on being a device-specific place. I assume there was reasons, and there was a lot of market research underpinning it, but it's also just really annoying, because the old iTunes was really good. Which is an odd thing to say, that iTunes is good. Uh, contemporary state of play, we have one big market, which is we have the iPhone and Apple on one side of the equation. Then we have everything else that's going on on the other side. Uh, the Google-based phones, the Android-based phones, the other applications that I haven't paid attention to, because honestly, when I jump shipped from Nokia and went to BlackBerry, when I jump shipped from BlackBerry to Apple, at that point in time, I started putting too much money into my Apple infrastructure to want to move across and build up the equivalent on the Android. And this all was a strategic decision to raise the barriers for exit and to create the entrapment that built up selling more to existing customers. And it worked. Also, that the 
iPhone device is still having the relative advantage of compatibility. I am familiar with how it works and it is still working in a familiar way. Apple is one iteration of its phone operating system away from destroying that at any given update. As soon as it becomes harder to use the device than it was before the update, the moment that happens, they will open the market back up to all the alternatives because the relative advantage of it just works will go away. Which is why I firmly believe that we are not at the end point. Apple will not be the dominant force forever because someone's going to pull the Nike. At the moment, we have Android and we have Apple and they are the Adidas and the Reebok. We haven't seen Nike come through yet. Apple will tell you that they were the Nike because they beat Ericsson and they beat Nokia. But they offered something different to what the BlackBerry and the Nokia and all those generation of devices were offering. At the moment, the smartphone market is still vulnerable to a third mover. And specifically, a third mover who comes through focusing on user experience with control. Apple, each incremental change, Apple and other smartphone developers are trying to take away control and feature sets. They want you to have less ability to customize. They want you to be more beholden to what they want to have on your phones. They want you to be a data point, a data capture, data gathering point on a map, not a consumer. First consumer focused group to come in and think we sell to the end user, not where business to business, will murder the current market spot. Also a quick uh, origin, villainous origin backstory. Uh, 1996, this was the radical new innovation. This was the Nokia 9000. It combined a mobile phone, a fax machine, and the internet together for the very first time. It cost more than a small car to buy and it cost more than a large car to run on a month by month basis. As a PhD student studying discontinuous innovations, I could not afford to own a Nokia 9000. It was too damn expensive for me to buy the thing that I was studying in my thesis. We couldn't even borrow one. We just had to make do with the public, uh, publicly facing information. So there is a origin backstory here of this technology is the cost of a current mobile phone around $1,300 to $2,000 makes the Nokia still expensive because it was around three and a half to five, depending on where you're buying. So we're talking about a good used car's worth of value. It would probably on current market rates go, uh, if you're looking at a phone that is about seven and a half thousand dollars, that's roughly where the Nokia was back in the day. So the question here is to shift and pivot the idea a little bit. The mobile phone itself is a product. The mobile phone is a service distribution platform. Each application within the phone is its own value proposition. So you can't easily look at a device like an iPhone and say, this is the definitive value offering. Instead, what you should be thinking about is what is the definitive opportunity that a device that is in constant connection to the user, what is the opportunity of that portable distribution channel to either augment the real world that you're in, augment the data world that you're operating on, or be the distribution platform of choice. And that's where I think mobile marketing this is, it's very early, and I cannot stress this enough of how young this is as a platform. That we're talking about 2007 for the release of the, smart, the Apple smartphone means that we're talking about 15 years of R&D in what we can do with this device as a reality augmenter. So my question, and what we're going to talk about here, is what can the technology do? The reason we don't have 
a subject on mobile marketing is it's too damn early. Uh, in about 15 years, 10, 15 years, hopefully by the end of my career, I will get to witness somebody running a full semester length course of mobile marketing. It won't be me because I'm very much the desktop guy. I'm That's my specialty. But let's talk about a couple of things. We're going to raise it we're going to go through these um, on a case-by-case -case basis. But functionally, this is the other problem that you have with mobile marketing, is when we talk about mobile phone marketing, are we talking about using it for phone calls, for SMS? Are we talking about its video chat capacity and the fact you can run Zoom on a mobile? Are we talking about the apps as on-device markets and marketplaces or on-device the advertising through an app? Are we talking about its capacity to be a payment platform and a smart card platform? The fact you can tap your wallet into your phone and now have your phone as a single point of contact device. So tap and go off a mobile, smart card and loyalty card and payment card, credit card and Opal card and bus ticket plus credit card plus it makes calls. And that's before we even start thinking about the other aspects of it, of it's a camera. It's a very good video camera. It's a very good still frame camera. It is a live, it can do live video. It can record video to drive. There's a whole bunch of different ways in which this multifaceted tool can slot into marketing activity. And then we pick up some other things. It's got Bluetooth. So Bluetooth and near-field communications allow for new solutions. They are solutions in search of problems, which we were describing the quick response codes. QR codes were originally described as a solution for which there is no problem. And then the play kit, and suddenly QR codes were the thing that we were all into. Uh, the phones have GPS which means that they have maps, which means that they know where they are, which means they have location enabled capacity, which also means that they have a lot of problems and issues. And they've got the capacity to augment the power of the individual. Uh, the phones themselves, because of the combination of different tools that are on board, have an active GPS signal, a Bluetooth signal, and the camera having a number of sensors attached to it, including movement, means that you can do augmented reality with the phone as a viewer. That is significant as a an upgrade, a game that has it's not a game changer because we have we're not in the game yet. This is a whole new game. So let's pick them off one by one. Let's start with telemarketing. All right, enough said. It's, it's dead. It's very dead. And look, I say this as a marketer. I don't answer unknown calls anymore. I've just stopped. And if you want to ring me and you've got my number and I don't have your number in my phone, that goes through to the voicemail and if you leave me a voicemail I will call you back. If you don't leave me a voicemail you're on your own. I have not received a phone call of value that has not been based on someone leaving a message on my voicemail. I have not had a phone call in probably coming up to five years that hasn't been from a number I already know that has been of value to me whatsoever. So that's it, the telemarketing approach, this side is dead in the water. Now, I know that you can spoof identities and there's a lot of issues in terms of spoofed uh, phone calls. Uh, hello, this is the computer department from Microsoft calling you. Plus one to avoid a fine from the ATO tax office that you can pay for with your iTunes cards. Look, telespam is why telemarketing's dead. Why would you answer the call when it's 95% likely to be someone trying to steal money from you and the other 5% was likely to be someone trying to tell you to spend your money on them? 
SMS. Uh, we've all got the SMS spam things of um, wonderfully misspelt bulk spam things telling us that a package was intercepted and unavailable. Pre preemptively press link to purchase solution to problem. And if you're dumb enough to press the link, well, game over. But equally, one of the things that's really frustrating is how god awful actual legitimate SMSs are. My gov. Get it together. You do not need to send me a text and say, there is a message in your MyGov inbox. Send me the message. You've got my number. All right? Where it works really well. Now, I think SMS is something that we overlooked as a marketing discipline. We forgot about it. And then suddenly it came good again. So I think this is a very valuable future. And what I see here is that the SMS can be the prompt, it can be the initiation, it can be the point where you can query someone, are they available for a phone call? Send a text, get a confirmation, yes I wish to engage by voice. Permission based phone call led by an SMS, I think has got a huge potential for the future because that is asking the customer to invite themselves to the engagement. The other thing that we're looking at here on the SMS is it is a massive augmentation to service delivery. And I think it's one of the best things that happened is one of the service manufacturers who was writing software, booking software for hairdressers, and it was hairdressers it started at, and then it moved over to doctors, included the ability to send an SMS prompt to remind you of your appointment. And then everything that was appointment based could send you an SMS prompt to confirm you still wanted the appointment, remind you the appointment was on, and embed an address that the phone could go and pull that address into the GPS. So your appointment pinged you and said, hello friend, it is 30 minutes into your appointment. Your GPS coordinates are here. Press button. It will take you 22 minutes to reach your destination. It's the platform and it's incredibly low cost. It's a really low margin, low overhead. This is why we've got problems with it in terms of spam is because it's incredibly low risk from a financial cost perspective, but also why it's incredibly valuable as a service augmentation is that it's incredibly cheap to be that little bit better in prompting and reminding your customer. Now, look, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but um, drop us a line in the forums if you think it would be useful to get an SMS text reminder of upcoming classes, upcoming tutorials, and upcoming assessment tasks. I want to throw this idea out to you to see whether we this is something we should start investigating as a value add-on for the ANU. All right, uh, let's talk video. I absolutely, this little device is my video camera. I use it for producing my YouTube show and I use it to create content. Ironically, it hasn't been used in the creation of content for this subject because I'm doing the split screen where I use my desktop. You, uh, but for the rest of what I do, I like to use that. Uh, you will see my, you would have seen my mobile phone join the live learning events because I use it as a foldback monitor. Uh, you can tell I have some experience with uh, music industry. I will log my phone into a Zoom call so I can see what my audience sees. And this is my, you want the hot tip trick out of the entire subject. If you're giving a presentation over Zoom, ask for permission to put your phone into Zoom whilst you are presenting from the desktop. You've got to mute the audio. God's sake, mute the audio. The feedback loop is a nightmare. But you'll be able to see what the audience sees. So you'll know if your slides are being shared. You'll know if you're on the right slide. You'll know how they look. But also, it's a really interesting idea that the video... We hit one of the things... Uh, the fact that mobile phones allow you to do video chat and walk around the place talking to someone else in real-time video over 5G, 4G connections is 
amazing. To my little Gen X experience, this was something that we thought of as science future that would never happen. You go back and you watch Thunderbirds and you, from the 1960s, 70s, you watch stuff from the 70s and 80s. The idea of what made it the future was we were talking to each other over video on video links. And it was mind blowing. And now it's just there. It's just a thing. Uh, it's amazing. It's absolutely, like, it is to me one of the most amazing shifts from a th an idea to a reality. And that's why we, I don't think we even know what we're doing with it from a marketing perspective just yet. I don't think we've gotten close to what we can do with it. Because I think that there is a role for video, mobile phone, video in service preview, service delivery and product preview that we just haven't explored yet. So I think this is the big, you want to talk about a future that's got potential. This is to me, one of the big points of potential. Uh, next place. Uh, wow. The app is genre. The apps, mobile phone apps are just, they're in their trough period at the moment. Every technology, there's, I can't remember the name of the technology curve off the top of my head, but there is a way that you look at technology and it starts off with a huge amount of promise, then it hits this valley of dire and dismal, and then it sweeps back up as we get better. We're in dire and dismal at the moment, which is a shame because apps deserve to be better than they are. The current pricing model of in-app purchase and dark patterns and loot boxes and all the crap that is going on right now where you can't buy an app outright, you can only buy, you get a free app that's filled with ads that you can barely swing a cat um, before the next ad is on. So the cat swinging app, knock over the following mice with a swinging cat. Oh no, an ad. That's just so bad because the platform is so young. This is an immature marketplace that is in the midst of growth. It hasn't, f it's, at that first part of the product life cycle, that big explosion, we are a decade, maybe two decades away from this settling down and us having enough time to have built ideas and built experience and built up a proper understanding of what an app can do inside a phone to augment the value proposition of the phone, the app and the end user. This look it is just to me. Um, if you want to look at an area to get into, I cannot um, endorse this harder than to say get into app based work, understand what the consumer wants from the app, understand what is the pricing structure and the pain point of the average consumer. Huge amount of work's being done around the whales, around the big ticket events. So all these terrible adverts that are, are you smarter than this user? Oh my God, I cannot believe this game is so hard. I can't get past level three. Can you do better? That is, we borrowed a huge amount of stuff from gambling. In gambling, the client that you want is the whale. The whale is someone who has way too much money and can spend that money and lose that money and still thinks of themselves as a savvy player and a smart operative, but they're basically crap at the game. So you want them in a poker match because they are the ones who overestimate their maths capacity and their ability to do card counting and all the other things, and they get gutted for their money, but they come out happy at the end. So apparently co-creation value happened. You can tell what type of card player I am. Also, I should point out that I'm a con artist and a, uh, I'm a big believer in the con and I'm trained as a con artist. And I think this is a field where the con artistry is currently dominating and we need to get the marketers back in there. As a marketer, your interest is in a recurring engagement with a customer. You want the consumer to come back next week. As a con artist, I want my mark to give me as much money as I can and never see me again. If you think about the way these apps are running, they're all about as much money as possible, no long-term. We want long-term. 
trust commitment and reciprocity needs to come back to the apps. Okay, geofencing. This one, I... <sighs> the ethics on this are horrendous. Yet, this is one of the promised lands. This is one of the things that the mobile phone, the GPS-enabled mobile phone, is an incredibly potent, customer-focused, customer-facing tool. It's also an unmitigated disaster for privacy. It is the tool of the surveillance state, and it's being done so badly, it's not worth... The price we're paying in privacy is not worth the reward we're getting for using geofencing. Now, the one place that absolutely smashed it out of the park on Geo was Pokemon Go, and they're currently cutting staff because Niantic is thinking about wrapping it up there. <sighs> Pokemon Go, the application, should have a 30 to 40 year lifespan. It should be as commonplace as a radio was back in the 80s. Geofenced is where the location, the software knows where you are and can enable you to... Sometimes it will tell you uh, about proximity. It knows where you are so it can advise. Uh, it's why Google always wants to know your location and why when you do a Google search, it wants to know your location is if you are searching for hairdressers, it won't, it's useful if it can tell you where the next hairdresser is in 200 meters. It's also, there, there are things we can do in games. There's things we can do with augmented reality. There are things we can do in terms of weather alerts, safety. Uh, my mobile phone, uh, using its geopositioning capacity, when I am driving from Brisbane to Canberra and back, is one of the best tools in my road trip arsenal, second only to the car. With the car, I can get there. With the phone, I can get there safely because it's pulling down data it knows my speed, it knows my relative location, it can pull up. Uh, the current thing that it's brilliant at is it can pull up the speed limit. Because it knows where I am, it knows what the... Uh, now the next thing is, if it could tell me what I was doing for the speed and give me a little uh, plus minus sign to say slow down or speed up, that would be brilliant. But the problem is... We're also using this data for the dark side and the dark patterns. We're using it for stalking. We're using it, the police are subpoenaing it to just sweep and say, a crime happened in the 2601 postcode. We'll sweep every possible phone there into a big pot and find someone to blame. That's not what it was supposed to be for. And also, it's just so many problems with doing it that way. It should be better. Please, if you get into the position where you can make it better, make it better, but put the privacy of the consumer as priority number one. Make it valuable for the consumer and then it will have an ongoing lifespan offer. Uh, mobile internet, we're all familiar with it. I've got to look up those stats again to see what they're doing. Mobile internet dropped dramatically during the pandemic for the first six weeks and then rose dramatically as everybody was home and we ran out of devices for uh, everyone in the house to use simultaneously. Good bandwidth will beat that problem. But equally, one of the things about the mobile phone as a mobile internet platform is it's absolutely killing, uh, on the one hand, it's killing pub arguments but it's making pub trivia so much bigger. Like pub trivia has risen in a direct re response to the existence of portable mobile phones that can allow you to Google the answer at a pub quiz. I don't get it. Uh, all right, Bluetooth technology. I was an early critic of Bluetooth technology because again, I initially saw it as a problem in search of a solution. Lately, I think that it is actually coming to the maturity it's needed. When it was first created, it drained the hell out of your battery life. Having Bluetooth on was something you had to make as a conscious decision. Activate the Bluetooth signal because it just burnt through your battery. You could get a day's worth uh, without a charge or you could get an hour's worth without a charge. We're now at the point that the Bluetooth has matured so well that we can use it for augmentation. Uh, your Bluetooth headsets, your Bluetooth speakers, 
Bluetooth, being able to flick content uh, via Bluetooth to another device. This basically makes this little device more robust. Same for near-field communications. As far as an early technology goes, this is a really, really, uh, hasn't begun to work out what we can do with it yet. I think there is a huge future in near-field communications that combined with a QR code, we got used to the idea of check-ins. We got used to the idea of carrying our mobile device and using it for proximity-based events, logging in to a location. I think that with near-field communications, we're going to be able to start building that up and building that proximity-based activity so that you can check into the gym, you can check into like your 24-7 fitness first or uh, any 24-hour gym, walk up, tap the phone, and it'll let you in. But also, since it now knows you're at the gym, it will be able to connect with near field and Bluetooth, being able to connect your phone to the equipment. So it can start doing logging. So you can go up to the treadmill, put your phone on its uh, NFC pad, which is also a wireless charger, and your phone talks to the machine. So the treadmill can pull data, stream content, play music, but also fill out your, your training regime. So there's stuff here. I, a near-field communication enabled gym that has a whole bunch of machines based on Bluetooth that you are able to log into by going and swiping your phone at the door will increase, will create value. Now the thing is, you've got to stop it being creepy as hell and you've got to make certain that it doesn't then start doing creeper feature um, and become a way of stalking women who are training at a gym because that's what a bunch of creepos are going to want to do with the data. So avoid creepers and fellas, don't be creepy. And yes, gentlemen, creepiness is our problem to solve. Now, oh my God. Um, I was wrong about QR codes from when they first emerged through to 2020. Boy, was I wrong. I liked them. I thought that they were an incredibly interesting idea, but I thought that they were an incredibly interesting idea that had no widespread market application because I was also very familiar with barcode scanners and I owned a couple of, uh, I owned barcode scanners. I didn't have a reason to, I wanted to. Uh, there's a thing called the QCAT. It was a barcode scanner that enabled you to use a print catalog and order directly from the print catalog to your computer. It was the 90s, bandwidth was scarce. It was still cheaper to mail an inch worth of paper, printed paper with barcodes and a scanner than it was to upload that catalog to the internet in the first place. Now, QR codes have just absolutely come into their own. They were a business solution they're still a business solution. They've now got a consumer front end and we got very familiar for two years in using them. I think we haven't finished where the evolution of the QR code. And my particular thing is augmented reality based QR codes as physical world markups. And I see this as, now augmented reality is my big future that I am expecting and hoping for where you can use your device via a QR code or its successor to be able to pull up additional information, to be able to pull up, again, this is what metaverse isn't promising, but it should be. But also we don't need a metaverse for because it already exists. A hyperlink to the information source based on scanner code, phone response. Uh, there's also some really interesting uh, consumer to consumer stuff that was done around QR and art. Uh, there was a QR geocaching game that was going for a while there where QR codes were being built into things or stuck onto things or hidden around the place. It was basically geocaching for geocaching for people who didn't like the outdoors. Until I was into it. Alright, augmented reality. This is my thing.
Uh, we already have augmented reality. It is a future that is here. It is just not evenly distributed. And it's so new. It's so emergent and it's beautiful. Like, I want to take a moment to say, as a marketer, the marketing potential of augmented reality is third on my list of interest. As a creator of content, this is where I think it's going to be incredible. I think we haven't scratched the surface of the art, of the performances, of the augmented gaming, of all the things that we can do with this experience, with this voluntary opt-in data layer over the top of the world. And it's getting better because we've got the processor power in the hand to render to do the new phones that have got the LiDAR, have got the ability to scan collision detection, to have got all these capacities that just weren't there 10 years ago, or where they did exist, that they were mounted to the front of aircraft. I mean, LiDAR is a passive radar system that's used for terrain following. We can now use that with a phone to follow something across a desktop. The video games that we are going to create, the board games that we're going to create, playing a tabletop based game with little miniature figures and playing with Lego where with the augmented reality we can put special effects. If you're playing a tabletop video game and you can have your physical piece that you move around the board plus you've got your mounted camera that you can see through and it can track the game board the combination is going to be incredible. The, the art we can create with it. This is where the future is. This is the value co-creation. And we've got it today. If you can say, hey Siri, and get a response. Oh, by the way, I have all my um, audio. I automatically switch off Cortana and Siri because I don't want an audio prompt based system. I don't own an Amazon Echo or any of those audio based systems because I don't want to use them. Um, I'm, I'm opting out. I don't think they're ready yet. But when you can say, hey Siri, tell me about this area. And the Siri system can pull up. Like you can get a walking tour, you can get an audio guide. We already have audio, we've had audio enhanced reality since we had the portable cassette deck. We have been doing this for a long time, but we can get even better. GPS mapping to augmented reality to audio enhancement. I mean, I emphasize Zombies Run because I used to use it for training when I was running through Hague Park, doing my five kilometer runs when I was going out for walks. If we combine audio overlay with geo fencing and geo tagging, so that we could tell stories of places and locations that you could engage in. The, not just the advertising, but think the product. Uh, what we're starting to be able to do with, the screenshot there is from Ikea. Ikea is starting to be able to give us an ability to measure a space and visualize an object in that space. That is, at the moment we're using it to sell couches, but the future it could become is incredible. So there's just, again, this is my area where it's just like, I can see a future and I want, I want that future as a consumer. I am not very, I don't care how we get there. I care that we get there. But also, there is just so much. The, the Currently the problem with augmented reality is the hardware that you need to create the content is outside the reach of the average punter. What we need, and this is what happened with music, and this is what happened with art, and this is what happened with graphics design. The moment that we have the Ableton Live software of augmented reality, the moment we have the SoundCloud of augmented reality, 3D printers that are still their prosumer, their professional level, they're not good enough at the consumer level yet. Same problem here with augmented reality. It's still a many thousand dollars worth of things. But in my lifetime, 
the first time that morphing was used in a video, it cost tens of thousands of dollars a second. And now PowerPoint can do it between slides. The future is freaking awesome, but badly distributed. And this is one where as soon as we distribute it, it's gonna be incredible. There's just so much we can do here, but it's also proof that we're in a very, very young technology. Uh, the changes that we could pull off. But I also just like to point out, uh, when I talk about augmented reality, I want it to be mediated through devices. I want it to be something where I have to opt in to my augmentation by attaching my augment filter. I am not comfortable with the Google Glasses approach. I'm not comfortable with the face overlay. And the other place that it needs to not happen is it cannot tie augmented reality to a non-consensual, non-opt-in face recognition system. Now, caveat here is I have face blindness and when I am teaching in a lecture theater, everyone looks like the same bundled block of hexagons and pixels to me. Uh, on a bad day of my face blindness, people literally look like sets of hexagons. I cannot determine features on someone's face. I cannot remember those features. It makes me really good as a marker because everyone is, everything is blind marked because I cannot recognize anyone. Uh, that's why I like Zoom based because I can see who you are because your name is at the bottom corner of the screen. So everyone's wearing a name tag and that makes life easier. Early in my professional assessment of augmented reality, I thought the most amazing thing you could do with it would be a Google Glasses style headset for academics, for teachers, where we had the eyes that had the facial recognition and I could look around the room and the name of the student would pop up. It's a little like TikTok filter over their heads. And then I realized how god awful that idea was as a mass market, creepy stalker enabling device and as a surveillance device. And it's like, this isn't worth 10 marks for participation. This isn't worth what the tool can be misused for. So y'all, y'all look like a bunch of pixels to me. And you're beautiful pixels, you're fabulous pixels, but you are by no way, shape or form, remotely unique pixels. <laughs> My life consists of a lot of people looking like um, human QR codes. And I deal with it. It's, that's, that is a thing, it's a feature. <laughs> uh, if you're kind of weirded out by the fact that, yes, I think that you look like a QR code, that's okay. If I walk up to you and start scanning you, that's when you've got to complain. All right, uh, I want to briefly mention non-device based um, mobile apps. Good God, there are places we don't need this. Tesla, rack off, you are not required. We do not need app based cars. Embedding, there's an old um, Douglas Adams ideal, but there's also a friend of mine, uh, Jeremy Orinoco. Uh, Orinoco is the username, uh, wrote a piece about, in a very Douglas Adams style, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, H2G2, uh, story about the stick. And you may have seen it making the rounds and being attributed to Douglas Adams. But Orinoco's view was, the value of a stick was its ability to be replaced. And the problem with the stick was, as soon as you started adding on other things like car keys or apps, it lost its ability to be easily replaced. I have this concern about app-based technology creeping into places where it's, again, a problem trying to find a problem, not a solution trying to find, not a, not a solution to a problem, but a problem finding itself being a problem and still looking for more problems to hopefully team up with and solve. Because at the far end of this, the ultimate pro the ultimate concern I have, and I drive a mechanical car, uh, a 1992 Suzuki Swift. The Redbird has no technology. It is an old, old war beast. But the purpose under which the mechanics do their thing, the wires and the cables and the bits of metal all do their thing. The reason why I don't have the newest, latest high-tech vehicles is 
a case of the technology is insufficiently mature. I, it's not where I want it to be before I start using it. It doesn't have a relative advantage over wire driven, mechanically driven for me. And here's why. I don't want software in mission critical elements when the current business model is subscription based. I don't want to have to subscribe to my accelerator pedal. I already pay a subscription fee to my car. It's called petrol. I do not want to have to pay a data download fee. Also, Australian data conditions are not good enough to risk having technology enabled vehicles uh, for an extended period. The reason why we don't have autonomous self-driving trucks in Australia is a bandwidth problem. Our roads are mapped out to the point that the trucking associations and the truck developers in Australia have identified that they cannot get enough signal, they cannot get enough bandwidth to their vehicles at the places that the autonomous vehicles would be at their absolute strengths because we don't have widespread enough internet access that's of high enough caliber. So basically, when a truck can't get the job done because it can't download enough data over 5G to drive safely, our technology is not there yet. So I think we can, we, again, it's something that will enhance, it'll get better. The bandwidth capacity we have now compared to what we had 20 years ago, greatly improved. But it's not the best it could be, and it's not where it needs to be for a lot of this stuff to work. Also, as much as I love my augmented reality concepts, it is data rich, data heavy, and these videos I'm currently recording at the 60 frames per second are massive file sizes that, thankfully, I bought myself some extra terabytes of hard drive space. But when we are needing to move that sort of data around for many, many thousands of users in simultaneous consumption, we're going to need bigger pipes, and we don't have that yet. All right, quick case study attack. Um, I just want to mention, again, uh, apps are bad. The adverts in apps are bad because they are successfully making money. As a con artist, it appeals to my little heart. We are ripping people off and getting away with it. As a marketer, this sucks. This sucks because the ads are crap and the ads don't need to be bad, but they are bad because they are meeting a need and they are meeting a need for a tiny niche market that can only be accessed but through saturation, carpet bombing, mass undifferentiated promotional campaigns are the only way to find the suckers who are the small enough niche who pay enough money to keep this goddamn thing afloat. The sooner we can educate those whales that they are basically there to be harvested for blubber and oil and money, the sooner this crap will go away. But also, the psychological profile, this is where psychology has some words, I have some words for psychology. Psychology has identified that there is a certain level of control that if you show someone making a mistake in an advert, there are enough people who want to go and use the in-group, out-group to show that they're smarter than the person in the advert, so they'll download the ad, and they'll play it, and that's all they needed was to get that hook to see whether, in fact, you're one of the whales who they can then use a gambling-based addiction dopamine hit, uh, small hit, pay reward, get next dopamine hit. They can use that to screw you out of your money. Psychology, you contributed to this, and engineering, you are also responsible. It is not marketing's problem alone. Uh, the complete re reverse your palate cleanser of the day is cats can see what's on a screen and cats react to face swap apps. Uh, so cats play with, you've seen cats playing with iPhones and iPads. So the internet is powered by cats and cats are all about mobile devices. As far as also augmented reality goes, the day that we can live stream from a cat's first person perspective, so you're going to need a cat wearing a little coronet with a little webcam. 
that cat is going to make a fortune. That cat's owner is going to make an absolute fortune killing of being able to real-time simulate being a cat. Also, if you haven't pre-ordered it, Get Stray. It's available on PlayStation and Steam. And also on Steam, there is uh, Big City, Little Kitty, coming out at some point this year. Very good cat-based gaming. The future of cat-based gaming is looking good. All right, theory and application. Last thing to talk about. This is one... This theory gets around. Uh, I like this theory. This is the unified theory of acceptance and use of technology. It is the attempt to supersede the Rogers 1995, uh, which I really like. And it takes a particular framework of interest to me because it's very close to what my thesis was. Figure two inside this paper is the idea of social influence builds trust, trust builds performance exp trust builds expectation around performance and that drives behavioral intention around technology. So we have a sequential way of influencing value uptake. The more socially influential you are, and here's where your Rogers model kicks up, goodbye influencers, hello early adopters, and the more people trust, hello parasocial connection, the better they will expect something to do the job. And that's the killer. Hello, expectations, perceptions, zone of tolerance. So you have steps here that loop around. Social influence is driven by some factors we've talked about previously. Trust, driven by other factors, including parasocial connection. Trust breeds performance expectation, which then leads to behavioral intention. So I like this model because it is, on the one hand, standalone, but on the other, so heavily cross-wired, we can see where the uptake of technology is driven by. And I just want to flag something to you. A few weeks ago, a person of social influence said to you, pick a technology use it. Guess what I had up my sleeve? I had this model. So if you want to explain why you used a platform and it was entirely because I you went, yeah, Stephen recommended it. I'll take that. I'll use Instagram because Stephen was talking about it. My lecturer talked about this. Oh, God damn it. Yep. That framework. You can use it to explain again. You've got a paper coming up that is going to tell me about how you were using a platform. What was your experience of using that platform? And the Unified Theory of Acceptance and Use of Technology is a fair piece of content that you can use to, if that explains how it worked for you. Now with that, mates, um, I'm available on the usual channels. It is week 11. I'm assuming things are a bit feral uh, the back end of the semester. So if you need me, I will be available on the email and I will open up a few extra consults if there's demand for it. But probably best just throw me an email, make a connection if you're needing, if you're needing direct intervention, if something's gone horribly wrong on the project, reach out early, talk to me, know that you are supported and we've got your back. And now, see you on a mobile device at some point in time. Oh.